scripture reading of God's Word today is Romans 10, 9 through 15. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between you and Gentiles, the same Lord, the Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So be it. Good morning. Start with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, for the renewal of life that we see budding everywhere. Father, we thank you for the life that we have through Jesus Christ, that you would send your Son to die for our sin and our shame, to restore us a right, with a right relationship with you. We just thank you, Father. Thank you for the time that we can be here and freely worship, open our hearts and minds to the words that you would have us to hear. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a few weeks ago, um, I did a sermon where we did a character analysis. And what we did is we looked at a character in the Bible and we analyzed that character to see what that character's life was saying, what attributes that character had. And we looked at Nimrod. And if you look in the Bible at first, you may even think that Nimrod was somebody who the Bible was saying was a mighty person in God's eyes. But he was a mighty person in men's eyes because his character opposed God. He was not one whose character was something that we would want to say would be a hero character in our lives. But the world thought that he was a great man, but he opposed God. Today we're going to look at a second character, and that's why this morning sermon is entitled, Who Am I? I gave you some hints before, maybe some of you took some time to study, but we're going to find out who that person is today. This person is mentioned 12 times in the New King James Version, 13 times in NIV, 14 times in the NLT. How can that be? This is a person's name. Well, because of a pronoun, okay? That's the difference. And this pronoun is he, so there's your first clue. It's a man, right? I hope so. In today's world, we have no idea, do we? Because it depends on what I feel like today, whether I feel like being a man or a woman. But in God's eyes, God created him as a he. That means he's a man. Okay? No doubt about it. <clears throat> this person's name is mostly listed with other people's names. I gave you that as a clue. So who am I? Let's look at a scripture and see if we can figure it out. Matthew 10, verses 2 through 4. These are the names of the twelve apostles. Ha! Huh. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who, dis who betrayed him. Mark 3, 16 through 19 says, These are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to who whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, his brother John, to whom he gave the name Bonerges, which means son of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Luke gives this account. Luke chapter 6, verse 13 through 16. When morning came, he called his disciples to him. He chose twelve of them, who he also designated apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who, was, 
who was called the Zealot, Judas son of James, and Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. Acts also gives us a list. Acts 1.13 When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. Okay, if you didn't catch it, we just narrowed it from 12 to 11, didn't we? Because Acts didn't have Judas Iscariot because he is dead and gone, right? So we've got 11, 11 disciples. Who am I? Well, after Acts 1.13, you will never find this person's name recorded in Scripture. So that should eliminate it down a good bit, right? This person is mentioned nine more times in the NIV. We'll go based off the NIV. <clears throat> if you remember last week, I closed with a Scripture from Luke 21. And Mark gives this same account also. But I didn't look at Mark's account. Usually I look at each account well before I do that. I don't know why I didn't look at that except that it was a God thing because we're going to pick up right there today and I never even knew that. We're going to read the first verses right after that. In the end of Mark, chapter 12, verse 41 through 44, this is the same account we read in Luke. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all that she had to live on. See, Jesus has come to Jerusalem, and he's still teaching his disciples. He's teaching them what it means to be like Christ, what it means to be a servant, what it means to be a child of the kingdom of heaven. This same story we find here where Jesus says, don't listen to the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Don't even do what they say because they definitely don't do what they say. But do like this woman here who gave everything. And we talked about that last week when we talked about how much we should give. And I didn't plan on these verses flowing just like this. That's an incredible thing. Jesus plans out. God plans out what these sermons are going to be. If I let him, if I follow his will, and that's tough to do sometimes. But it just amazes me when I figure out, when I was reading my Not a Fan book last night just before I went to bed, because I was like, I haven't read that book yet. There's another story that goes along exactly like we were, like I'm preaching today. And it wouldn't surprise me, Bob, if your Sunday school lesson didn't. It's amazing what God has planned for us, and that He has everything in order. We are a part of history, a part of His story, and we are writing a story that either goes along with Him and the things He says and does, or we're writing a story against Him, like we found out with Nimrod. And today we're going to find out a better character, a better hero. The next verses are Mark chapter 13, verse 1. Right after Jesus talks about the widow, he says, As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when all these things will happen, and what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled. Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. They are still being deceived. They are looking at created things rather than the Creator. Jesus has been telling them all along that He's going to Jerusalem, that He's going to suffer and die for them, and that He's going to rise again on the third day. And they're worried about created things. They're saying, Look at this mighty creation around us. What do you think, Jesus? Missing the whole point that Jesus had come there to give up his life for them. But what we get here is we've narrowed it down to four, haven't we? Okay, so from those four, who is it? Yep, yeah, because we hear a lot more than nine times out of the others, and we hear more about them from Pentecost. So we know it's Andrew. Good job, you figured it out. The disciples were totally unaware of the destruction that was coming to Jesus, and they're totally unaware of the destruction that's coming to Jerusalem. If we read on at the end of that chapter, Mark 13, verses 32 through 37, it says, But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. 
You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each one with their assigned tasks. Did you know you had a task? He's not only talking to the disciples. He's talking to all of those who will choose to come and follow him. And he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. The disciples had no idea of the things to come. They didn't even see Jesus, that he would be, they would be spending the last night with him in just one day. They didn't understand that Jerusalem would fall. And Jesus is still trying to teach them, still trying to say, listen to me. Listen to the words I say and apply them to your lives. Don't just listen. Don't be hearers of the word and not doers only, but listen and live a life accordingly. So what are we doing with our lives? Are we living like children of the Father? Are we living like children of the kingdom of heaven? Are we telling others about Jesus Christ in words and in actions? About redemption through the blood of the Lamb? That Jesus is the only way, that it does matter in this world that says it doesn't matter. If you want to be religious, be religious. But any kind of religion is okay because they're all the same. That's a lie from Satan. There is one way and that's through Jesus Christ. And we need to be speaking that. We need to be living that. Do you agree? If you agree, then how do you live your life? Should have asked the other question first, shouldn't I? Maybe not as many people would agree. It's your life, right? But it's not your life. It's not your life even if you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christian, God still created you. He had plans for you. He still has plans for you. Your life is not your own. You would not be here if it were not for the grace of God who gave you the breath of life. If you're a Christian, He owns you again because He purchased you back at a cost, the cost of Jesus Christ's death on Calvary. That's how much God loves us. So what are you doing with not your life, but the life He allows you to live. Are you living a life like Christ? So, who am I? We've answered that question. It's Andrew. We'll see three times in Scripture when we can learn some character attributes about Andrew. So let's look a little further. In Mark chapter 1, we learn a little bit about Andrew. We learn that he's Peter's brother. And we learn that he lives with Peter and his mother-in-law. But that really doesn't tell us anything about his character, does it? Mark 1, 29-31 says this, As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. So we know where Andrew lives. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. She went to her, took her, he went to her, took her hand, and helped her. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. You can keep reading, but you won't discover anything really about Andrew's character. You'll just understand who he is. You'll understand that Jacob is my son, but you won't know anything about his character until you dig a little deeper. <clears throat> Peter was mentioned first. He's always mentioned first in the Scriptures. Is that because he was the older brother? Most people think so, but not necessarily. Scripture doesn't tell us. James and John, if we look at, at them as far as examples... James was the older brother of John, and we see James mentioned before John a lot of times. But a lot of times we see John mentioned before James because John is a more predominant character in the story. So Peter's always mentioned first. Why is that? Is it because he's the older brother? Is it because he's dominant? We don't know for sure. If we look also at Peter's name, Peter's true name was Simon, right? Cephas. And he, and that's a Hebrew origin name. However, Andrew's name is of Greek origin. Now, I don't know about you, but it says a little bit about the times. If times are changing like we see today, and we have an older son who's a Hebrew name origin, and we have a younger son who's a Greek name origin, it might be because things are changing, times are changing, and we're accepting more. Don't know, just my thoughts. But Andrew's name is of Greek origin. And it's ironic that we'll find out later in the story that Andrew died in Greece, spreading the gospel message there. He was concerned about all people, not just the Jews. 
His name means manly or of valor. <clears throat> I can see Peter, James, and John arguing a lot of times, can't you, if you've read your scriptures? Arguing about this or that. Who's going to go with Jesus on this? But if we examine scriptures, we find that Peter, James, John, and Andrew were part of the inner circle of friends of Jesus, his most intimate followers. But we don't see Andrew mentioned as much. And I think, again, this is my thought, it's because Andrew was sitting back, following and learning what Jesus had to say. While the others were a little thick, and they weren't getting it. They were arguing among themselves about who was going to be the greatest, and we find that in Scripture. And Andrew was sitting over there saying, you guys just don't get it, do you? Look at Jesus. Look at the way He lives. Look at what He's saying. Look at how much God loves us. Look back at the prophecy that God would send a Messiah. And He sent Him in the form of a servant. And He teaches us that. So it doesn't surprise me when Andrew's left out. In Luke 8 verse 51 it says, When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. I don't know if Andrew was right there. I assume he was. But I'm assuming that he need, Jesus needed to keep teaching Peter, James, and John something. I think Andrew, like I said, was having it figured out. When we see the transfiguration of Jesus in Luke 9, verse 28, says, About eight days after Jesus said this, He took Peter, John, and James with Him and went up to the mountain to pray. They got to witness the transformation of Jesus. I think Andrew already knew. It was clear to him. He was living a life. He was taking a silent back seat, but he was absorbing all that Jesus was teaching him so that he could live a life like that. He didn't worry about fame. He didn't worry about this world. He was hung on every word that the Master said. Maybe Luke, those, both of those verses from Luke, maybe Luke just left out Andrew. Maybe he didn't think much of Andrew. But we can look at other gospel accounts and learn more, can't we? And they say the same thing. Andrew was not there in those occasions. He wasn't there for the transformation of Jesus. One of his closest friends. The only thing that makes sense to me when I ponder it is that, like I said, he didn't need to be there because he had it figured out. Maybe he was busy telling someone else about Jesus. I'm not sure what the point was. But in my opinion, and I always tell you when it's my opinion versus Scripture, I think that he had it figured out. And that, that I admire about a quality character of this hero. So let's see if we can figure out some more details. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 20 says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were, they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and follow him. Mark gives a similar account. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Now we've got a character trait of both here of Peter and Andrew. But at once they left their nets and followed him. I can't say that. I don't think most of you can say that. Most of the time my answer when I think God is calling me is, wait just a minute, or, am I sure what you're saying first? Moses did that if you remember right, until God got mad at him. And then I say, okay, I'm sure you're saying it, but I need to accomplish this first, God, before I'll do that. That's not what they did. They immediately left their nets and followed Him. They didn't question Jesus. They didn't make excuses. They didn't hesitate. They were fishing. What were they going to do with their boat? Did they even take time to tie it up? What about the catch that they had on the deck? Were they just going to let the fish rot? Did they think they were coming back to it? I, I don't know. They just left everything. They left this world behind because they had found what life was about. What the purpose of living was that we were created and redeemed to be in a relationship with God. Now we could stop right there because we know enough attributes, but we can go on further and find out more. Following Jesus is not easy. He never said it would be. It's a life of denial. 
It's a life of giving up and dying to my life, my desires to follow His. And that's exactly what Peter and Andrew did because they found Jesus. John gives us more details about Andrew's calling. And if you look in your Bible, sometimes it'll reference this story precedes the story we just read about. When we re read about the story in Matthew and Mark, that's when Peter and Andrew were called to full-time discipleship. John's rec record is a little bit earlier than that. In John chapter 1, verse 35 through 44, it says, The next day John was there again with his two disciples. And it's talking about John the Baptist. Because, see, Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. John had been saying, the Messiah is coming. It's not me, but there is one coming who is greater than I, who I'm not worthy to tie his sandals. And he's telling them this, and Andrew is there. He said, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. He pointed out, this is who I've been talking about. When the two disciples heard him saying this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Then it says Andrew. We don't know who the second person is. If you read and study John, though, you can probably assume that it was John. Because John talks about himself but doesn't say himself. And John will say things like the one that Jesus loved. And the one that ran faster than Peter and so forth. So I'm pretty sure the other disciple here was John. But we don't know for sure. But verse 40 says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, so we know that's who that is, was one of the two that heard what John had said, John the Baptist, and had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon. So he wasn't there. That precedes the other scriptures we were just talking about. This is when Andrew had his first encounter with Jesus Christ. And what did he want to do? i got to tell somebody. I love my brother Peter. He's got to know that I found the Messiah. The one that we've been looking for is here. And he says, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Wow. That's what friends do, isn't it? Just like the four friends who brought the paralyzed man and had to dig through the roof to get their friend to Jesus. The first thing Andrew thought about was not, what am I going to do with my boat? What am I going to tell my mom and dad or anything else? Or what jobs do I need to get finished? The grass needs cutting today. He said, I've got to go tell Peter, my brother, about Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, is tr which when translated is Peter. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, were from the town of Bethsaida. John tells us about how Andrew met Jesus and how that he was so overwhelmed that he had to tell his brother Peter. That's the heart of a disciple. When you come to know Jesus, you can't keep quiet. You can't worry about the things of this world. You've got to tell others about what God did for you by sending His Son Jesus to die, to restore you back to a right relationship. He loved his brother. He wanted his brother to know Jesus. And he had a telling. That's what it's all about, telling others about Jesus. If we read on in John, we find out that Jesus enters Jerusalem. We know what's going to happen. We know that he's going there to die. And he just has healed Lazarus. Not healed him. He's raising from the dead. And all the people are saying, Who is this Jesus? So as he comes in, there are some Greeks that want to meet Jesus. They asked Philip, who then asked Andrew. Okay, so let's read about that. In John 12, verse 20 through 22. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. With a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew... Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Now, why didn't Philip tell Jesus? I don't know. But what I can ponder from this is that Andrew was the one that you go to to say, hey, will you go with me to tell others about Jesus? And he said, yeah, of course I will. Let's go. 
because that was his attitude. I, I don't know about Philip. I haven't studied him as much yet. We might study him one day. But I know that Andrew wanted to tell others about Jesus. We just found that out. The first thing he did was tell his brother Peter about Jesus. If we read on, we'll read one other account. I'll have another reason why I think Philip went to Andrew also. But we'll talk about that in a minute. These were not Jews. They were not God's chosen people. This would have been something foreign. They've seen it a little bit in Scripture so far. We've seen the Samaritan woman and we've seen others. But these are Greeks wanting to come to see Jesus. They could have simply said, Jesus doesn't have time for you right now. But they didn't. They said, you want to see Jesus? You want to know Jesus? Well, that's why we're here. Let's take you. And they took him to see Jesus. That's what Andrew does. He introduces people to Jesus. He's my hero. I hope you can see why he should be yours. Andrew has the right heart. A heart to tell others about Jesus. And that's the heart that any disciple not should have, but must have. <clears throat> he doesn't worry about himself. He worries about others needing Jesus. Because if they die, they don't know Jesus, right? And if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, how can they come to the Father if they don't know Him? Like the scripture that, we, that Merle read this morning, how can they know the gospel unless someone tells them? And how beautiful are the people who spread the message, who get it, who understand that this is what life's about, that my life is not worth living unless I die to myself and live a life telling others about Jesus Christ. There are only three times that we hear what Andrew has to say in Scripture. The first is when he tells Peter about finding Jesus. The second is when Peter, James, John, and Andrew ask about the things that are to come, the destruction of Jerusalem and about Jesus dying. They're saying, teach me more. And the third time, Jesus is trying to get away from the crowds. He's tired. The crowds have been there. They're, they're wanting to know who He is. As our book says, there are tons of fans, but there's not as many followers. And we'll read on in John chapter 6 that many left Jesus that day. But He's feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. It's getting late in the day. And His disciples say, send the crowds away so they can get something to eat. And Jesus says, no, I'm still teaching. And I'm not only teaching them, but I am teaching you. Maybe Andrew will get it. Maybe Jesus is thinking that. And he says, you feed them. Well, we can find the different accounts and you can read more. But basically what happens is all of the disciples, except Andrew, my hero, says, that can't be done. Where are we going to find that much food? And if we found it, how are we going to purchase it? We can't do this. How is it even possible? And we'll read that Philip was one. Philip, the same one who went with Andrew to see the Greeks. Another reason why I think. He's one of the ones that says, <laughs> this can't be done. But Andrew says, maybe it can. And let's read about it. John chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said, Philip, where can we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. Now remember, when Philip brings the Greeks to Andrew, this is much later than this, okay? So we've gone back in time, not to mix you up like some of those movies do, okay? So the first time was Andrew telling Peter, Second time is this. Third time is when the Greeks come. Okay? Anyway, Philip answered him, said it would take more than half a year's wage to buy enough bread for, for each one to have even a bite. The others say that the disciples said. But John points out that Philip says. I'm sure all of the other disciples were saying this can't be done. And John records Philip's response. That there's no way we could even give them one bite. Remember, there were 12 baskets left over, weren't there? We can feed them, but we have to have faith, don't we? Another of his disciples, well, who is it? Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, still in the shadows of Simon Peter. You don't think Andrew knew that when he went and told Peter? But it didn't bother him, did it? He knew in his heart, I'm going to go tell my loud mouth brother 
who's going to take all of Jesus' attention and time. I'm going to not even be seen or recognized. And we don't find him much in Scripture. But he didn't care. He said, I've got to tell Peter that I found Jesus. And here he says, he spoke up above the other disciples and said, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But he still doesn't have enough faith. But how far will this go among so many? But he takes him to Jesus. And this is what he gives him. Sounds a lot like the widow with her two mites, doesn't it? I don't have much, but here's what I have. What will you do with this, Jesus? It's all I have, but I give it to you. And we know the rest of the story. All the people were fed and fed, and fed to capacity. And there were 12 baskets of leftover food. That's what Jesus can do with our faith. Whether we have a little or a lot to give him, we can't all be Peter's but we are all called to be like Andrew and tell others about Jesus Christ. He had a faith that surpassed the other disciples. He said, Jesus, this is all I have. Take it. Use it. And we saw what happened. We read in scriptures that Jesus is the bread of life, that we should be more worried about our spiritual life, feeding our spirit, than we are about feeding our bodies physically. If Jesus is the bread of life... Shouldn't we be distributing that bread of life to others? Isn't it what we're called to do? Do you see the difference in Philip's answer versus Andrew's? Do you see maybe why he came to him and said, there's some Greeks that want to talk to Jesus. What should we do? Andrew's like, let's show them Jesus. It's simple. Let's tell them about Jesus. How many times and how many opportunities do we have to tell others about Jesus? To invite them to a movie night, to invite them to church, in our workplace to say, when they say, oh, you don't drink, do you? Well, no, I don't because of this reason. And I'm not saying drinking's wrong. I'm not going down that road. I'm saying a chance we have to discuss Jesus Christ. It can be, hey, don't you go to church? Yes, I do. Let me tell you why. I know Jesus. There's so many opportunities. Yet we think that if we give our all to Jesus, He's going to say, hey, go to Africa. That's not what he's going to say necessarily. It might be. What he is going to say is tell others about the joy that you found. Tell them about how much God loves them. Tell them what I did for you. Tell them about Jesus. That's what he's going to say. Nimrod, we looked at him. His name meant rebel. He was also called in Scripture a great hunter of men. Andrew was a much better hunter of men. He cared about their souls. He told them about Jesus. His hunting had everlasting results. If you look in your bulletins, you'll see a little well, you'll see a quote from Matthew where it says, Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But also there's another one down there that says, If you ain't fishing, what does it say? I don't have it right in front of me. What does it say, Jacob? You aren't following. Are you a fan or are you a follower? Because Jesus said, Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say you might be. He said you will be. So the difference is, are you following him? Because if you are following him, he'll make you fishers of men. You'll be worried and concerned about telling others about Jesus, not about this life. And guess what? This life will still go on. Things will still get accomplished. He'll still bless you. In fact, He'll bless you so much more. You'll never figure out how you had the time in the day to do this or that about telling others about Jesus because you had all these other things that had to be done. But yet somehow they'll get done because Jesus knows your needs. But he, what He has called you to do is to be a fisher of men. <clears throat> Have you ever heard of Edward Kimball? Nobody? Come on. That's surprising. I was going to figure out some of you had. Edward Kimball, I was going to say probably not, okay? but Edward Kimball is a Sunday school teacher that said, you know, I've had enough of this kid. I'm going down to where he works, and I'm going to tell him about Jesus Christ. You know who he told about Jesus Christ? D.L. Moody. You know that name, don't you? You don't know much about Andrew. You know a lot about Peter, don't you? At, at Pentecost, Peter preached and over 3,000 people were saved. But would he have been preaching if Andrew didn't say, here's Jesus? 
Come, brother, I have found Jesus. Well, if you follow the story, Edward Kimball told D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was saved. He inspired F.B. F. B. Meyer to come to the USA and motivate J. Wilbur Chapman, who rec recruited a young baseball player named Billy Sunday. While in Charlotte, he asked Mordecai Ham to con conduct a, a citywide crusade where Billy Graham was saved. One person, Andrew, could be you, should be you, because we're all called to be fishers of men. Don't hear much about the Andrews or the Edward Kimballs, but look what can happen when we start to become fishers of men. Remember when he, Jesus first called the disciples to their permanent call of discipleship? He said, drop in your nets. And they said, but Jesus, we've been fishing all day. He said, drop in your nets. Okay, since you told us to, we will. And they had to call the other boat with the other disciples over to help them because the catch was so big. You've got to have faith like Andrew. You've got to follow after his example. There's a true hero. We don't read much about him. After Pentecost, we don't hear at all about him when we start hearing about the acts of the apostles. But we do know he was a patron saint of Russia, Scotland. We know he went out abroad. He died, like I said, in Greece, spreading the gospel message. Tradition has it that he died on a cross, on an X-shaped cross, and suffered for two days. As people walked by and saw him, he told them about Jesus. He wasn't worried about his life. He wasn't worried about living or dying. He was worried about telling others about Jesus. Who am I? My name is Andrew. And his desire would be to tell you so that you could tell others and become fishers of men. I told you when we started that God has it all figured out. Last night when I was reading, this is the story I read, and I was like, wow, this is just like what I'm going to close the scriptures, the sermon with about, um, I've got to remember his name, Edward Kimball. <laughs> this is authored by Kyle Eidelman. He is a uh, pastor of a mega church who has wrote many books. His books are very good, and we're studying this, not a fan because he doesn't want you to be a fan. He wants you to become a committed follower. And we're just getting to the last portion of the book, which I read all of this book a year ago, except for the last portion again. Don't know why, but now I kind of figure out why. And this last section is called Following Jesus, Wherever, Whenever, Whatever. Well, that title right there applies, doesn't it? And as I'm reading along, it says, let me find the one tells a story. It says, This week I listened to a story about a family that dates back to an ordinary day more than 50 years ago. It took place in a small town, St. Joseph, Illinois. It was a lazy Sunday afternoon at home for this family. Two men knocked on the door. One man was named Orville Hubbard. Orville used to work in the oil fields. He had minimal education and was just, as, just a very normal, ordinary guy. The other was named Dick Wolf. Dick met this young family when their wives were both in the hospital giving birth at the same time. They asked if they could come in because they wanted to take this family, uh, talk to this family for a few minutes about something really important to them. They met this family while they were in the hospital. See the opportunities? Who would have ever thought? Now listen. There was nothing much else to do, so the husband invited them in. He sat on the couch with his wife, Orville and Dick. Orville and Dick Wolf began to present the gospel. They talked to this family about what it really meant to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The couple sat and listened. There in one small town, th there is, excuse me, there is one small but important detail I don't want to leave out. There was a young boy playing with his trucks on the floor. He was about eight years old. Everyone thought he was just playing with his toys. But that little boy was hanging on every word. That day changed every thing for that family. The next week, the mom and dad, along with their young son, gave their lives to Christ and were baptized. Two ordinary men said wherever, and Jesus pointed them to this family's house. I think it's fair to say that I would not be writing this book in 2011 if it hadn't been for what happened in 1956. The couple that answered that door I call Grandma and Grandpa. So you never know. But Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. 
Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your love and your commitment, Father, when we're not committed to you, that you are faithful and true. We thank you for the examples that you give us in Scripture. Even when the person that we're looking at, not much is said about, when they take the background instead of the spotlight, and we see the difference when we study what can be done with just one little spark. So, Father, I pray that we let our light shine. I pray that you give us the boldness just as the apostles prayed for under persecution in Acts. When they were told not to preach the gospel, they preached for boldness instead to preach the gospel. Give us a heart like Andrew, a heart that doesn't worry about our own needs and own desires, but just wants to tell others about the joy that we have through Jesus Christ. And may you multiply, Father, the offerings that we give you. May we share the bread of life that only Jesus Christ can bring. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.